Alright, so this one uh, was actually suggested by um, Bella, I believe her name is, who is Owen's friend that's actually doing some videos uh, for this channel now, uh, who suggested it in a video like months ago, and this only just recently got back to me, so this probably would have happened a lot sooner. Um, but here it is now. I, I do still plan on doing like the whole Best Picture theme, uh, just kind of sporadically throughout. Uh, that I ended up not doing, because everything is all out of whack now. But um, I figure this one's kind of a good one to start with, to get us sort of uh, back in the groove of things, hopefully. Um, though it is worth noting, obviously, that I have mentioned quite a bit that this is this genre is not particularly my area of expertise, but um, like, especially in the um, Jane Austen world, there's like you'll notice that I tend to like more uh, movies that are about Jane Austen as opposed to adaptations of her actual work. Like, uh, I really liked Austen Land quite a bit, and uh, I really love the Jane Austen Book Club for obvious reasons. But, um, and uh, honestly, though, I do remember, um, oh, I, I saw it like a really long time ago, back when uh, I was still renting VHSs from Blockbuster, is when I first saw Emma. And to my surprise, I actually remembered being pretty fond of it, uh, and how there was just something about it that felt a little different and a bit more charming to me, uh, in, com in comparison to the rest of the whole, uh, sort of costume, I can't say costume drama, because obviously, um, with Austin we tend to, in many cases, get more into the comedy aspect of it, which I think in turn probably is what kind of adds more of an appeal to it, uh, where it's, at times you can associate this, like, with the Merchant Ivory era, you can sort of uh, take this genre in, in the more, like, you know, really super serious sort of way. Um, whereas the Austin adaptations are a lot more sort of light about the material, um, which gives them a lot more charm and really makes them a lot more accessible in the long run also. So, uh, yeah, I figure we'll start with uh, Pride and Prejudice, despite the fact that it came almost a decade after the release of Emma, but um, being, like, I, I'm going to assume the most, you know, famous of all the awesome stories and the most beloved um and this particular adaptation really does stand out there's also the um the, i think it's Greer garson and olivier version um which i've also seen which doesn't really I, I mean obviously it's a decent adaptation but um it doesn't really have like sort of the life that this one does um and there's also obviously the colin firth May series that's prob probably the most beloved adaptation, at least from what I've heard from other people. Um, and as far as this story goes, it's really interesting how you can find something so romantic um, when the story basically centers around like romance and marriage being a business more than anything else, uh, particularly through the eyes of uh, their mother, uh, Mrs. Bennett. But the thing here is it's, it's kind of gets you immediately is just kind of the way the characters interact themselves particularly just the family in general but you know the sisters in particular also um where we do sort of see throughout um in for various in various circumstances uh just the closeness that they are sometimes it might seem a bit um because obviously there's the whole thing of being married off one at a time but it has to be in sequence or otherwise one of them yeah, it just doesn't look good i guess um, but, um, there is the sort of, everything between them, interestingly enough, the only one that kind of really stands out is, uh, Mary, who is ironically named because she seems almost, like, as miserable as, like, the way they see Darcy later on when they comment, and it's like, he just, he just looks miserable constantly. And it's like, it almost seems like she would be more suited for him based on their personalities, at least from what we see at the start on the surface before we really get into them. Um, Mary still does kind of get the shit into the stick in regards to watching the sisters throughout the story and how they progress, but still. Um, one of the, um, main things to look at, though, is, um, Jane, I believe, is the oldest one, uh, played by Rosamund Pike. And what's really interesting, to, uh, to watch this is also, um, when you see sort of the, the innocence, uh, that Jane has in the casting of Rosamund Pike, it's like, now that we live in a post-Gone Girl world, it's really interesting to look back on this, which was, like, nine years prior to that, um, and just how, it kind of shows off how great of an actress she is when you see what she's doing lately, and then when you look at this sort of earlier performance, 
Um, and then there's like, um, the, like, like I was talking about, basically the sort of, uh, how, basically how things affect all of them throughout and the way that sort of somewhat affects how they interact with each other. But there's also the main point to get to with that uh, would be Mrs. Bennett and how she does it because when you look at it in the way she more or less, you know, in, in order to keep the family alive, it more or less has no choice but to be as obsessed uh, with the whole business of marriage as she is. And it's like the second you get wind that somebody has, you know, a steady income, it's time to start marrying them off. Um, but there is still, like, the way it could have played off is, like, that's basically just what her character was. Um, but there is still, like, a back and forth between her doing that and her also showing, like, genuine love. Like, there's the whole thing of, um, when, um, she, what is it, towards the end, uh, when one of them starts to get married off, uh, it's like half her reaction is, oh my god, my poor baby, and the other half is, you know, how could she have done this? Um, and so, the, and, but the way uh, Brenna Blossom's really able to battle with that, she ended up with a BAFTA nomination for this also, uh, which is really easy to see why. Because um, she's mostly shines in, like, you know, Mike Lee stuff and stuff like that, and um, Little Voice is something that really stands out too. But um, in this one, it is really interesting to sort of see the sort of dueling kind of personalities that she has, but we know where both is coming from, particularly the more loving side. It's just that we kind of see the business side of her more prominently throughout it. Um, and then there is, uh, the whole love story angle, where, like I said, we, basically when we first see Darcy, the whole thing is just how totally and completely miserable he looks at all times, and then when, you know, Elizabeth overhears him talking about her in a negative way, um, and how we, we know, because we know these stories well enough, um, the more the two characters hate each other throughout, um, the more likely they are to fall in love, but the interesting thing is that these characters are a lot less shallow than that usually shows, because um, they kind of both have their particular... Obviously, we see Elizabeth's much more up close, um, but with Darcy, there's more, like, kind of revealed as it goes on. Like, there's a particular moment um, somewhat towards the end when it's like, we we kind of keep getting... It happens to him multiple times, <laughs> uh, where we seem to have one particular vision of him um, which kind of immediately makes us jump to a certain conclusion about him, and then there's, like, always an explanation that kind of makes him look nobler for whatever it was that he was doing. Um, and particu particularly, uh, the reveal about him breaking up Jane and Bingley, um, and it's, like, just when it seems like he's about to be this villainous figure, um, once he explains himself, it's like, oh, so he's one of the more, you know, noble characters in the entire story, okay? <laughs> um, it's like, no wonder he looks so miserable, he just keeps getting a bad rap throughout the entire movie that he doesn't deserve, um, this movie or story, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that also makes the love story a lot more intriguing also, um, and... But the thing about that, though, is the fact that their relationship is so romantic, at least in the long run, um, and just just sort of the way uh, that the movie depicts sort of romance in general. Like, there's, like, there's the presence of romance and the absence of romance, uh, usually at the same time. Like, for every, you know, like, genuinely in love moment, we have another moment to kind of counter it where we have, like... Uh, when Collins is offered uh, one of them after I think it's Jane that he wanted, um, my, you'll notice the details on this are not exactly... These aren't stories that I know front to back, so forgive me if I misplace a name or a detail, but um, he's been offered one of the other daughters, and his response is, uh, that's, an, that's a very agreeable alternative. And it's like it's just such a contrast to the actual genuine romanticism that actually ends up coming into play. Um, but they both sort of play off each other nicely, and it sort of also had, adds that sort of humor to it um, that a lot of movies in this genre are often missing. So, um, and even just the little things in there also in regards to the humor, like um, when they're introduced at the party, and it's just that, or some gathering of sorts, and obviously each one has to be introduced, so it's just Miss Bennett, Miss Bennett, Miss Bennett, all in a row for however many there are. Um, or when uh, Wickham finds himself in the story. And there's the moment when, like, all the girls are fawning over him, and it's like, you know, he picked up our handkerchiefs, and, like, that's the most romantic thing they've ever seen. Um, and that that being the most romantic thing that he does is kind of also telling to the direction his character ends up going, but still. 
Um, also, the thing that really stands out about this is um, just the way it's made in general, I think is what stood out to a lot of people and kind of put Joe Wright's name like really out there. Because um, this was two years before he and Knightley collaborated again on Atonement. And one of the most famous scenes in Atonement is the really long take during the war scene. Um, and two years prior to that, he also had one of those really long takes that he perfected here. Um, where we go through, like, the whole ball, and it's like... And what's interesting about this is you can tell just how sort of long and flowing it feels, despite the fact that it's only it only covers, like, three minutes. Um, but it still... It feels like it does so much more in that time, because we've got, like... We've got Mary being denied uh, by Mr. Bennett at the piano, and then it flows over to um, Mrs. Bennett talking about how, like, this will be, like, a most advantageous marriage, and she's, like, just really happy with herself... And then it goes to, like, um, there's Darcy there, and there's, um, everybody walking around. Collins keeps, you know, popping back up into this, uh, just kind of looking dejected. Um, then we've got, uh, the scene where Bingley walks by, and he's, like, sort of, you know, pawing at Jane's dress as he, as, from behind her as they go by. Then it goes to, like, Kitty and Lydia laughing, and then it's, um, Elizabeth just kind of, well, there's Elizabeth with Charlotte, and then it's her, sort of, the two of them talking about Bingley, and then we get shots of, like, everybody just dancing, and then, obviously, Darcy kind of coming in and out of this. Um, and then it goes to Mary being comforted because she was denied the piano, and then it goes to an entirely different room where Elizabeth is just alone in the dark. And everything I just said is in one flowing shot that's only in the span of three minutes. Um, and it's, it, it, there's a reason that not only is that one of the more famous scenes in the movie and one of the most well done scenes and does it just show off everything from performances to production design to costumes and all of that. Um, there's also, like I said, it also just shows that Wright can do stuff like that and tell the story in a nice way, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like he's showing off, which is something the long take can do is make it feel like the director's just kind of showing what they can do and really trying to put their fingerprints all over it. It really just feels smooth enough that it doesn't feel, you know, intrusive at all. Um, and that flow sort of sticks with it, so that's really great. Um, and then as we get closer to uh, the ending, obviously, the ro the romantic part is really going to start. To, like, the business angle is going to finally start to die down a little bit, and we're just going to get to embrace the romance in all of its genuine glory uh, when the two of them reunite in the fog. Um, and they they embrace with the sun behind them, which I think was a lot of the, you know, posters and advertising. I think it's on this cover even. Yes, it is. Um, so, um, there's all that, but then there's also the scene that follows it. Um, because one of the real unsung heroes of this movie is Donald Sutherland as Mr. Bennett. Because there's obviously the scene earlier when her mom is desperate to get her with Collins, and her dad takes up for her. Uh, in that moment. And it's just this really great moment between the two of them and a great moment for his character. Um, and he's there to just kind of be like a somewhat comedy relief throughout it as he's reacting to all this stuff that's happening in his house with his family. Um, but then there's this scene at the end where she has to convince him to basically consent to this marriage with Dorothy. Um, and it like brings him to tears. And it's just this really beautiful moment, not just between them and the scene prior, but the whole... Uh, father-daughter thing, I think, is sort of something that doesn't get near as much attention as it should when it comes to this story in regards to just how much power it has also. Um, so, yeah, that's about uh, what I feel about Brian Bradshaw. Like I said, it's an, I wish I was like a lot more passionate. I do really love uh, those really genuine romantic scenes, but once again, it, it is a genre that's sort of hard for me to get super passionate about like there's that's the thing too is like i say this is like one of my least favorite genres but it's like it's just one of those things that's just kind of inherently the way it is because it's not like i can really criticize much about it it's just something that's not particularly for me i guess um but it, when it's done as well as this is then it does stand out for even people like me that don't particularly gravitate towards the genre as much um and as far as, like, um, like obviously I was talking about the performances. Kira Knightley did get um, not just an Oscar nomination for this, but a really out-of-nowhere one, if I remember correctly, because 
It was um, it was only Brenda Blythe and they got in at BAFTA, which is shocking that Knightley didn't. Um, and the I think the only thing she had to her name was a Golden Globe nomination because uh, uh, Zhang Zi from Memoirs of a Geisha was getting all the slots uh, that Knightley wasn't, and then Knightley beat her for that final spot in Best Actress at the uh, when the Oscar nominations came out. Um, and I do think I haven't seen Memoirs of a Geisha since it came out, so I don't know if I can compare the two of them, but I do think it's a really kind of cool and inspired nomination that she did get in though, especially when it totally seemed like she wouldn't. Um, and then it's also interesting when I was talking about um, some of the other movies in this genre, but most notably like, all the superior pieces go back forever, um, but the thing here is this shortly follows like that Merchant Ivory era, where they're still going obviously, but I mean that real era where they were just like in their heyday from like the late 80s into the early 90s. Um, with stuff like, you know, Room of the View, Howard's End, and Remains of the Day, and all that. And you see, uh, the producing team on Pride and Prejudice, and a, and a number of Joe Wright's works, on top of a lot of other stuff. Um, Tim Bowden and Eric Felder are probably names that you see a lot when you watch movies like this. Uh, where, not only that, like, obviously I mentioned Joe Wright and Atonement and all that, but they've also got their names on, like, Elizabeth, uh, The Theory of Everything, uh, Les Mis, The New Les Mis. Um, and it's almost like those two guys are kind of, even though, you know, Merchant Ivory is like a producer-director combination still, when you see uh, Bevan and Feller mentioned together, it does almost seem like they're kind of taking over uh, the crown that uh, Merchant Ivory had in regards to the genre and how they're just kind of seeming to continue it a little bit, but they're, they're obviously they have slightly different focuses, but still I think it's interesting that we kind of have them sort of, you know, maintaining that throne and then going on with it, so... Um, it'll be really interesting to see what else they end up getting their names attached to and how that, you know, fares with that. But, uh, in the meantime, let's go into Emma, which, like I said, is a movie that, more or less, despite how I feel about this genre, I was kind of, I kind of liked, uh, way back when I was younger. Um, I think that has to do with, like, probably their, because, once again, the humor and just how it's more or less, you know, there's just, like, a constant pleasantness throughout it, where, like I said, usually some of these stories and, like, the Merchant Ivory era were known for being, at times, seeming, like, a bit more... Brooding would be a strong word, but not as cheerful as when you look at something like Emma. Um, I also say this as not having seen those movies in a while, so I may need to revisit those, but um, I think it's also the fact that there's, like... there's There are a lot of characters in Emma, but it's not necessarily too many to keep up with as long as you realize, like, which ones are the most important ones. So, like, with the relationships and the motivation and stuff like that, it's, like, it's not overly complicated like these movies sometimes tend to be and when they have too many characters and all that. Um, and it also kind of came out at an interesting... actually came out at a really interesting time because, on the one hand, Austin was, like, all the rage the year before because this was 96, in the year before, in 95, we had had um, Sense of Sensibility, obviously, and then there was uh, the Colin Firth version of Pride and Prejudice, and then um, Persuasion with Kieran Hines. Now, the other interesting thing is that another, technically another Austin adaptation in 95 was Clueless, uh, because Clueless is the updated version of Emma. Like, it uses the source material, but set it in, like, the high school setting in modern day, 95. Um, so it's like, I don't know if it's, like, oddly timed or brilliantly timed that this came out the year after Clueless. Like, you see a high school movie like Clueless, and it's like, oh, that succeeded, we should cash in on this. But the way they cash in on it is to do the period piece version. It's it's really interesting. You can definitely see how that usually would probably be the other way around, but um, they, yeah, apparently they really bet on this. It even says on the back, the way they advertise it, if you liked Clueless, you'll love Emma, which if you don't realize they're the same story, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's another thing too, was I was surprised when I saw this and realized that it was a period piece because just, just judging by the cover and then that comment, um, you may not realize right away that that's the genre that it's actually in, but, um, yeah, so obviously we have this, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow performance at the center of it, uh, two years before she would go on to do a similar, you know, period piece comedy and win an Oscar for it, 
Um, but here, um, just the way she plays this character, because this character could be, like, um, I, this obviously kind of takes us into Clueless also, but we may or may not be talking about that really, really soon. Like, really, really soon. Uh, so, um, as far as just Gwyneth Paltrow's portrayal of Emma, it's like, this is a character that probably would be really easy to get sort of annoyed with, especially with the way she's so... Just the whole purpose of her being is to basically be gossipy and put her business where it doesn't need to be. Um, and, like, the way we see her, you know, at the beginning taking credit uh, for the marriage that we've just seen happen, and then the way that she immediately must do this for Harriet, uh, Tony Collette's character. Um, and the, and just, but there's something that's so charming, not just about the character itself, but the way Patrick plays it also, where it's... Um, just how confident in herself she is. Like, the moment when she is, um, shortly after she's gotten her, she's, like, kind of pushed Harriet away from Martin, and her response is to say to herself, uh, well done, Emma, and this really, because she's still frantic at the same time, but she does, she still has enough room to congratulate herself on other people's success or failures. <laughs> Um, to the point that it's even used against her much later, when I think it's Knightley that says, uh, badly done, and you can see just how much it just takes her to rock bottom immediately hearing that. Um, but it's also, um, just watching her be so oblivious, uh, particularly with the early scenes with, uh, Alan Cumming playing Elton. Um, she's oblivious or clueless, if you will. Um, and it's in these particular scenes where, um, not just a lot of the comedy is, like, the like obviously, um, Alan Cumming is great in this. I, just those little moments with Elton throughout uh, his entire screen time, like, uh, when we can so clearly see that his thing is for Emma and not Harriet, and she is just absolutely has no idea of this whatsoever. Um, so there's the moment when, like, they unveil the painting that she did of Harriet, um, and everybody claps, and then once everybody has stopped, Elton goes on, like, five seconds longer than everybody else, just clapping himself in silence. <laughs> um, and then there's the whole thing of, um, when they're, um, shit, what was I gonna say? Um, oh yes, uh, when he and Harriet are talking, and she's sort of, you know, listening in on this, thinking her plane is falling into place. Um, and he's saying that he loves something, but of course it's just celery root. And I like the fact that we hear this strictly from a distance. Uh, like, the way she would hear it. Um, so, uh, th so yeah, just that whole storyline in general. And then the scene later when it's like, we see just how starved she is for gossip. So he's talking about, like, um, like what, what a letter says. And she's kind of, you know, trying to listen in on this. And Elton keeps, like, bothering her. And because of this, she misses what the letter says. And we can just see it just eat away and kill her spirit that she didn't get to know every single thing about what this letter says. <laughs> Um, and like I said, this is a character that would just be, seem like really, you know, obnoxious, and maybe to an extent that's the point, but, um, there's still just something endlessly charming about her anyway. Um, but obviously particularly in these scenes with, uh, Knightley, and the thing that I kind of like about the whole Knightley storyline, um, with Jerry Northam playing him, is that it's... Obviously, I have some out with Darcy. It's one of those romances where you can tell, even though they're friends throughout the movie and they say this over and over again, um, we still kind of see the somewhat rivalry just between them, like a sort of wit rivalry. Um, and the thing here is, it doesn't necessarily, like in another story, we would immediately and kind of, you know, tiresomely say, well, obviously, since they're bickering enough, they're obviously going to end up together. But the way her and Nightly play off each other, at least in this movie, um, that's just not something that kind of happens right away. At least I didn't sense that. Um, and it's not something that you, like, immediately go to, which would have possibly hurt the movie the rest of the way, because it's like, oh, we're just waiting for that to happen. And yeah, if you feel enough for the characters and you're charmed enough by the movie, that wait can be, you know the exciting part of the movie as opposed to the oh we know it's gonna happen predictable kind of movie so this one handles that really well where it actually doesn't seem right away like that's gonna be like they're each other's future which I really like even with the whole um, archery scene which of course uh, just that one scene with them shooting their bow and arrows obviously is like the perfect you know sort of Cupid symbolism with Emma doing that 
And it's like, oh, that would have been like an interesting little side joke, if not for the fact that that's literally what the marketing went with. <laughs> <laughs> so to actually call her Cupid in the tagline and have the poster just be her with the bow and arrow, of course. Um, but like I said, had they not completely plastered that, it would have been a nice kind of a little symbolism of sort, if not all that subtle. Um, but as far as um, the other characters go, because obviously the more rich thing about these particularly awesome stories is going to be like some of the side characters. Um, I really love what Tony Collette is doing with Harriet, especially much like, it's almost exactly like I was just talking about with Rosamund Pike in Pride and Prejudice, where it's like, it's interesting to see the more sort of hardcore roles she started taking on recently, and then to go back to Emma and see Harriet as like this sort of, you know, soft, naive sort of character, um, and how perfectly, perfectly she can play both. There's even the, uh... The moment with the dogs after um, Ellen has gone to marry somebody else, after Emma has finally convinced her to supposedly love him. Um, when they're with the dog, and she sees that the dog has brown eyes, just that pathetic way she says, Mr. Elton has brown eyes. Um, and just every, and just it just gets more pathetic, like, oh, you know, I, I hope he has the right jacket or whatever it was. Um, and just worrying about him when he's pretty much out of the movie entirely at this point. Um, where, once again, like... Paltrow, she really finds the line to make this character, like, sort of pathetic and whiny, but to the point that we still kind of love her anyway. Uh, and it's not something that grows tiresome with the character, or makes the character unlikable or unwatchable in any particular way. Um, so that was a really nice balance they had to find with these characters, but every everybody does also. There's also, um, Ewan McGregor comes in relatively late, um, where we have the whole storyline with Churchill and how they've both been hearing about each other for the longest time, and they only finally see each other in this moment when she gets her horse stuck. And it's like, I feel like there was probably a bit more um, to play with there, story-wise, about the fact that Churchill keeps getting built up and built up and built up, but we don't see him for so long, and because of the era that we're in, she has absolutely no idea what he possibly looks like, and he doesn't know what she looks like. Um, but no, they just kind of happen upon each other, and that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, and it is sort of a nice presence here to kind of make you sort of, He's basically here as, like, you know, misdirection. That's basically what his main purpose is. Um, and he does that fine. It is interesting to read up on it and see that... Um, Apparently, McGregor kind of... Apparently, he said he actually regrets doing the movie, but it's not It's not that he he likes the movie. Like, he liked how the movie turned out. Um, but apparently, he thought his performance was bad. Apparently, he absolutely hated his wig. And he said the only... Really, the reason he took it was because he was... Uh, like, it was, it was a lighter movie and a lighter role and all that. And obviously, it's the same year as Trainspotting. So he kind of wanted it's the same, I believe it's the same. I think Merrimack's put both out also. Um, so it's like he'd already done train spotting. So he kind of wanted something a bit lighter. So where like number one, just to, I guess for the balance, but also he didn't want people to like always associate him with like you know the the gaunt junkie sort of type. So uh, so it's easy to see why he took it. But um, I think he doesn't need to be that hard on himself about it. It's it's fine. Um, and then obviously there's other characters, um, that are really fun just as they come in and out, like Miss Bates, uh, Sophie Thompson, who is amazing in this, and also it's kind of a nice sort of family thing, where I talked about how, you know, prior to this, the sort of king of the genre were movies like Sense and Sensibility, Howard's End, Remains of the Day, all of which obviously feature Emma Thompson, and of course Sophie Thompson being her sister in real life, and who, who plays, uh, Mrs. Bates in the movie Miss Bates's uh, mother is actually their mother in real life, so it all kind of fits in nicely there, too. Um, and then it takes, um, obviously there is, it is well made, maybe not well made to the extent of Pride and Prejudice, especially with some of the interesting sort of camera tricks that, uh, Joe Wright was trying out and some of the shots that he got, um, in the long day in particular, but we do have some of these moments, like the way Harriet's talking about, uh, telling the story when she ran into Morton, so we get the kind of her narration on top of the actual, you know, scene happening uh, is kind of a nice sort of meshing of where we are in the story and seeing it for ourselves also, while hearing it from her perspective. Um, and there's, you know, the the obvious cut when um, Churchill rescues Harriet and he picks her up, and the shot of him, you know, grabbing her hand to pull her up, 
cuts to him holding her hand while she's at home and starting to lay down uh, is a really nice shot also. So, um, yeah, and uh, obviously, once again, though, it all comes to where we end uh, in the romance where the two people who we've been waiting to come together do finally come together in the ultimate romantic moment. Um, but whereas uh, Pride and Prejudice was actually a pretty, you know, big, sweeping, romantic, you know, almost epic feeling moment, um, this one's just really sort of nice and downplayed and charming and a bit funny about it also, where they... But there's still a lot of, you know, romance in it, even when he still calls her, uh, you know, his friend. Um, there's still something in there that, like, that underlying the real romance, um, there's, there's just something really, uh, nice and genuine about that. On top of the score in this moment also, the score, uh, did win an Oscar, um, but it, it too, <laughs> to kind of go, I mean, it's, it's, it's great that that happened, but it is worth noting real quick that this was in that era where there, there was, like, just a small time in the 90s where the score category at the Oscars was divided between drama and musical and comedy. And of course the drama score went to The English Patient, which just mopped the floor with everything that year, so had the categories not been split up, it probably wouldn't have beat The English Patient. Actually, I'd almost guarantee that. Um, but it is nice that it was able to still um, squeeze that out, and it is uh, certainly earned uh, to a particular extent. Um, and obviously it surprises no one, uh, costume design was also an Oscar nomination thrown at it, so, um, I, you know, weirdly enough, despite all the great detail, I believe Knightley was, like, one of, if not the only Pride and Prejudice nomination, um, I'll have to check that again, but I want to say that, but, um, yeah, so, as far as Emma goes, obviously, it is nice once it gets to the end and just sort of everything sort of... So after all the conflict, everything so easily kind of eventually falls into place. Um, where obviously, you know, Elton goes off and marries somebody else, but then we've got... Uh, and then, you know, Churchill does the same, or at least gets engaged. Um, so then we've got, obviously, Knightley and Emma ending up together, but then that just leaves Harriet alone. And then, voila, she just shows back up and says, oh, by the way, I ran into, you know, Martin again, and... Now that's happening. So it's like, so like maybe almost too perfectly falls into place, but I think that really just kind of goes along with the just general pleasantness that we've had and seen throughout the entire movie. Like, even when this movie's conflicted, that's actually when it's at like its funniest. Uh, so, like, especially the moment after the Christmas party with uh, Ellen and Emma in the carriage when he's like confessing to her and like his whispering, like, scares the shit out of her, and he's, like, he, once he realizes she was trying to set him up with Harriet, like, the more he mentions Harriet's name, the, suddenly the more repulsed he seems. Um, and it's, like, well, while incredibly cruel, there's also something really funny about it, just in context in general. Um, so, while I would say that Pride and Prejudice hits harder, like, emotionally, um, there is just something so irresistible about Emma's sort of cheeriness, like, like, as far as, you know, production value and performances and all that stuff, um, I would probably say that Pride and Prejudice was the better execution and the better movie, but, like, I feel like secretly in my heart I kind of prefer Emma. Like, if I were to choose to rewatch one of these two, I would probably choose Emma first. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, like, and it's weird how Pride and Prejudice does have uh, quite a bit of you know, there's not something, you know, particularly broody about it or anything, but when you compare it to something as, like, constantly joyful as Emma, it almost seems, like, dark by comparison when it's really not at all. Um, so, yeah, so that's how I feel about these two. Like I said, not knowing the stories all that well, apart from the couple of times or so I've seen the movies, um, and not really being aware of the source material. So... Um, that's where I stand with this, um, and like I said, next week we might just continue to talk about, uh, this particular story and what's going to be with it, so, which is not an Austin adaptation at all, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, until all of that, um, I think that's it for this.